My name is Andrew Glasner, and I work as the creative director of the Imaginary Institute. My background is varied. I have a training in computer science originally, and I worked as a uh, computer graphics researcher for many years. I worked at places like Xerox Park and Microsoft Research. And then things took a funny turn. I found myself directing an animated film and then directing several short live action films. And then I was the writer and director of a massive multiplayer online internet game. So after spending a year working on that game and directing actors and writing scripts, I found I was really enjoying that a lot. So I switched my careers and I went to film school. I enjoyed film school a lot. When film school was over, I worked for a little while as a screenwriter and then decided I wanted more control over my work and became a novelist. So I wrote a series of novels, which I'm still working on. I still write fiction. And then, um, but was continuing to work as a consultant in computer graphics and storytelling. So I would find myself often working with game companies. In the mornings, we would talk story, and in the afternoons, we would talk hardcore computer graphics. Then a few years ago, when deep learning started becoming popular and started appearing in the press, I was reading diametrically opposed stories. I was reading scary stories about how, how machine learning and artificial intelligence was going to ruin everything. And I was reading stories about how it was going to be wonderful and it would make everything great. And I thought, I need to know this for myself. So I taught myself the science behind these ideas and wrote a book on deep learning. And recently I've been working as a consultant helping studios put deep learning into their visual effects and gaming pipelines. Deep learning refers to a collection of techniques for making sense of and extracting information from data in a general sense. So if you have a collection of images, say, and you want to be able to categorize them, and you want to know what they are pictures of. Is this a wolf? Is that a toaster? Is that a toaster oven? Deep learning systems are programs that can be trained to look at these pictures and return to you the label of the object that is most prominent in the picture. They can also be used to extract other kinds of data, including the very abstract. And so they can learn about motion data, they can learn about textures and shapes and objects, they can learn about how things change over time. So if any time you have a collection of information that you have recorded and saved, and you want to extract in meaning, you want to extract new knowledge from that data, the deep learning refers to a body of techniques that let you do that. There are several different ways that this can be done. And rather than discuss them all, let me give you one in particular. There is a technique returning to understanding images, say. You mentioned, how do we know if a wolf is a wolf? The computer doesn't actually know what a wolf is. One important thing to keep in mind when people talk about deep learning is the word deep does not refer to deep understanding or deep knowledge. There is, in fact, no understanding and no knowledge of that sort in these systems. They're really very stupid. They don't have semantic knowledge of what they're working with in general. So, for example, if we want to know if a picture of a wolf is a wolf, we will have first trained the computer. We will have shown it many, many pictures of wolves. And we will have told it, this is a wolf, this is a wolf, this is a wolf. Here are pictures of squirrels. This is a squirrel, this is a squirrel, this is a squirrel, over and over. The idea is that the computer learns for itself what to look for. It trains itself to find patterns in the images and in more abstract data, if that's what we're using, that allow it to make the distinctions we're asking for. So for example, if we want to know if a picture is of a wolf, the computer first often will train itself to look for low-level features. It will look for little 
bright lines, little dark lines, little bright spots, just very low level features in the colors of the image. Then it will take those and combine them into larger structures, collections of bright dots and collections of dark dots. It might find a collection of four dark dots that are arranged in a little bit of an arc. Maybe that's a paw. Now it goes to a higher level and it says, do I see any large black dots that are surrounded by four small black dots? If I can, that's a foot. And then so forth, it works its way up hierarchically. It's able to find fur that's arranged in a long line and it might say that's a leg. And then if I can find a leg that's next to a foot, then that's a complete leg. And if there are four complete legs and there's a body and there's a head and there's a nose that's shaped in just this way, by working its way up to ever larger and larger structures, it is eventually able to say why the combination of elements that I have found match the combinations of elements that I saw when you showed me pictures that you said had the label wolf associated with them. So I will say that this too matches statistically those pictures. It has those kinds of qualities. So I will say this too is a wolf. It has no semantic knowledge. It has no deeper understanding of what wolves are and that they're beautiful when they run in the snow and how they act. It's just looking for these features in the pictures, in the pixels, accumulating those features and saying, what do those features correspond to in the examples I've been shown before? In fact, that information is never explicitly provided to the computer. The beauty of the whole system is the computer finds that information for itself. We do not have to tell it what to look for. It refines its understanding, and I'm using understanding in a very loose sense. There's no deeper understanding, but understanding in the sense of there is this collection of patterns that it is able to detect and combine, like bright dots and dark dots and dots that are near one another and blobs that are close to one another. It learns, and this is why we call it deep learning or machine learning, by showing it millions of examples, typically for an image processing task like this, we would have millions of images, and we would show it to the computer over and over and over again. The computer, and we tell it what answer we want. When the computer gets it wrong, we change the algorithm a little bit. We change the numbers just a little bit because we know what answer we want it to give when we're training it. So first we train the system. We say, here's a picture of a wolf. What do you think it is? And the computer says, it's an apple. Say, no, it's not an apple. And we change, or we don't, it changes itself. We write the program that directs how the change occurs. But then the change happens algorithmically. All the numbers in the algorithm change a little bit so that the next time it sees that picture, it's just a little bit more likely to say wolf than apple. Then we show it 1.2 million more pictures, and we do this over and over again, and then we show it the million pictures again. And every single time it gets it wrong, we adjust all the little numbers a little bit so that they're more like the answer we want to get out. And the hope is, if we do this long enough, all those little adjustments will accumulate so that it is now more likely to give us the proper answer, the one we have determined is the right answer beforehand, on every example. A neural network is a collection of these tiny little bits of program that we call neurons. And as I've said, they're not really neurons like the neurons in our brain. They're just tiny little bits of programming that do a little bit of multiplication, a little bit of adding, and then a little test. That little bundle we call a neuron. When we have lots of neurons, we take the output of one and provide it as input to another. That is a neural network when you have millions of them connected up in this way. 
The neural network is the name we give to the algorithm that performs that process. So you can say that the neural network is the program that does the learning. So we provide the picture of the wolf to the neural network. And again, this is just a program. It is just a big collection of these little bits of programming that we call neurons, and of course, some other programming as well. The neurons do their very simple little thing. They do some adding, they do some multiplying, they do a little test, and then they pass on their output to other neurons that do the same thing. This huge collection, this huge network of neurons is the neural network. So the picture comes in, the, if we have a picture of a wolf, then we have some thousands or millions of pixels, little dots of color. So we hand it that list of colors as inputs to the neural network. The neurons modify those, the neurons take those colors, add, multiply, do their little test, move them on, and ultimately some numbers come out the far end. And those numbers are in this kind of a situation, the probabilities that the input image is a wolf or a toaster or a patio or an oven or a golden retriever. And we just look at the list of outputs and we say, which is the most probable, which has the highest probability? That is the output of the neural network. That is the prediction of the program for what it thinks the numbers that were provided as an input are a picture of. One of the exciting things about using deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these technologies in visual effects is that we're still discovering how to use them best and where to apply them. And we're finding new applications all the time. A famous application that is widely used right now is denoising. It means to remove imperfections from an image. So if we create an image at great expense with a computer system, but there are artifacts, there are problems, maybe there are bright and dark speckles, we can apply one of these learning algorithms that is able to say, I have looked at so many pictures and I know what pictures ought to look like. And you're showing me this picture that has artifacts. There are little lines, there are little speckles. They shouldn't be there. I'll take them out for you. And I'll make you a picture that looks like a normal picture. This is something that computers can do automatically for us in many cases now. And that is a remarkable savings in time. It means that we can generate images more quickly because we don't have to worry about some of these imperfections. We can generate them at lower resolution sometimes. So we are able to leverage the fact that the computer knows what pictures ought to look like to save us some effort. But there are many places that we can use these techniques. We can interrogate motion libraries. We might have millions of motion clips and we want to find all the ones of a character sitting down. Well, if we've been very good at labeling them all, we might have names like 037GG14, the name of the movie, the name of the character sitting down. That might be the file name. But often that's not the file name. The file name is just some random set of characters. But a computer can look at that motion clip and say, I have looked at so many motion clips of characters running and jumping and standing and arguing and frowning and sitting down. And this looks like one of someone sitting down. And so I'll just label it that. And you, human being, don't have to sit there and look at thousands of clips to find the ones of people sitting down. We can use these techniques to generate models and textures and indeed motion clips. We can use it to generate more of whatever it has seen before. We can use those perhaps as is, as backgrounds or secondary characters, places where they're not important, or we can use them as starting points for artists to modify for things that are more prominent. Sophisticated is, is a complicated word. <laughs> There's a lot of interpretation. Certainly these extremely realistic faces 
are sophisticated. We, we, we look at them and increasingly they have fewer and fewer artifacts. They look more and more real. That's fascinating. There are many places where, where these techniques are used behind the scenes that are very sophisticated in the sense that they're very technically complex. Again, like the example of finding particular bits of motion or finding information in a library or creating complicated uh, motion or images or models or textures that we can then use as starting points for other operations. Those in themselves are very complicated and sophisticated operations. And as they evolve, they will become even more so. I would actually say we need to be far more than careful. We need to actually prevent some of these things from happening. There is a case to be made that when a technology is deployed and used broadly, it cannot be undeployed. We have seen this time and again with any kind of technology. This technology has a particular danger. The danger is that it is a unknown, impenetrable, remote, all-powerful entity that can control our lives. These systems can determine whether or not our children get into a particular school, whether or not we get a credit card, whether or not we get a loan, whether or not we're allowed to get a particular job or move to a particular city. As time goes on, these systems will be used by governments and also by corporations to gather more data and use that data for their purposes, not for ours. Corporations do not exist to benefit us. Corporations exist to make a profit, and they will deploy these systems to make more profit. That is, it is not immoral. Corporations are amoral. They, they, they don't, they don't care. They, they are made of men. As, as John Steinbeck said in The Grapes of Wrath, speaking about banks, they are made of men, but they are not men. They operate according to their own rules and their own logic. So corporations will deploy these systems for their benefit. And we will find ourselves increasingly changing our behavior to accommodate these systems. After all, if you are the parent of a child and that child wants to get into a particular college, and the college admissions now are being done by human beings, and we sort of understand what most of them are looking for. And there are even counselors who will help children do particular extracurricular activities or take specific classes to make them look more attractive to a particular college. But when college admissions are being done by these deep learning systems that are using huge st statistical aggregates to determine if a child gets into school, that child is going to dramatically need to change their behavior to match what the system demands of them. In the same way, we will have to change our behaviors in many, many ways. If we want to get a new apartment, when we apply, the landlord sends the system into a deep learning system to determine if we're a good tenant. Well, if we want our tenancy application to be approved, then we have to live our lives in such a way that the computer out there somewhere is going to look at our data and say yes. If we want to get medical care, well, there are only so many surgeons. Our application is going to go to a hospital's deep warning system to determine who gets access to that particular kind of operation. Well, we will have to live our lives in such a way to improve our chances that the system will say yes. This will happen in terms of housing. And even now, these systems are being used to determine how long people go to jail. In the United States, deep learning systems are being used in courtrooms to determine if a particular defendant is likely to reoffend, And if they are, they are given a stiffer sentence meaning longer time in jail. These are deep learning systems that are using statistics to make these predictions. We don't know what they were trained on. We don't know how they come up with these decisions. The companies that make these products aren't telling. And yet, courtrooms are buying them and using them. And they are being used. People are going to jail for intervals that are being determined by these systems. So already, they are dangerous. And as time goes on, they are going to become more and more dangerous. And I liken these 
to the Greek gods. The Greeks feared the gods, the pantheon of gods that they were, that they were convinced controlled their lives. And they had the characteristics I mentioned before. They are remote, they're all-powerful, they're impenetrable, and they're capricious. Well, that's what these systems are. And so we will find ourselves in fear of the deep learning systems in the same way that the Greeks were in fear of their pantheon of gods. This is not a good situation in my mind. This is not a society I want to live in. And I believe that if we act now, if we act before this becomes prevalent, we can prevent it. We need strong legislation, strong oversight, and strong enforcement of the laws that we create, and then strong penalties for those who offend. Because as a culture, that's how we regulate behavior, with laws. So we need to institute these, and we need to do it soon, and we need to do it with effort, because once these systems get deployed, they will be so profitable and so efficient, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to claw them back. So I am optimistic that with good intent, we can craft laws and regulation to prevent these scenarios from occurring.